You know, I may be known as you know, a former Air Force pilot or a uh, professional football player, but for those of you who don't know that our speaker today, Russell Maryland and myself, you know, Russell's better looking than I am, more talented, but we actually are professional thespians. Let's watch this if you can get a picture. <laughs> It was famously called the Thanksgiving Blunder, and Leon was lambasted in Dallas and beyond. I was very disappointed in my grandson. Someone egged his house. Someone did donuts on his lawn. Both of those people were me. But now... Coach was always, you know, telling us to play hungry. Play hungry. Play hungry. But I thought he meant to play literally hungry. It seems there was more to the story. Out of his mind, crazy hungry. He was lost. It was like he was possessed by a demon, a demon that did not know how to play football. Play like crap. One investigation. His stomach was completely empty. I don't think I remember seeing Leon eat anything. There's been a long history of people who've made that exact same mistake. Napoleon's army actually ran out of croissants on the way to Waterloo. Seeking the truth. that could give one man a taste of redemption. Snickers and NFL Films present The Man Who Played Literally Hungry. I sure hope you guys enjoyed that. But as you saw, Russell and I, I mean, we took actually professional acting lessons to do that. No, I'm just kidding. But would you guys welcome my fellow actor, thespian, to the podium, Russell Maryland. Russell, come on up. <laughs> hey, brother. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we are twins. <laughs> Is your mic on? And very good actors. What did y'all think about that? Yeah. OK. Well, hey, Super Bowl was a couple weeks ago, man. Do you have a favorite Super Bowl moment? Oh, uh, well, you know, I've been to so many, you know. <laughs> well, you know, I'd have to say my favorite Super Bowl moment wasn't a moment in particular, but it was the first Super Bowl when we played the first time against the Buffalo Bills in Super Bowl 27. And, uh, you know, the first time is like, the, 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 you know, it's, it's the best time because we had a, a bunch of young guys on defense, no name defense, nobody was uh, in the Pro Bowl, but we played together. Uh, we played hard, we practiced very hard all that week, and uh, it just really came together for us. And then when we beat the Bills 52 to 17, it was just a culmination of all the hard work that we put into it, and that was the greatest feeling in the world. I'm impressed you remember the score of the game. You know, I've been hitting the head so many times. <laughs> okay, I mean, you've been blessed. You've been to play on some phenomenal teams. University of Miami, a couple national championships, you know, uh, three, or three Super Bowls. Was there a difference between either of, either of those? Well, the one common denominator really was just a lot of hard work. Uh, and then <clears throat> just a matter of the guys coming together and really going out there with the attitude and not cocky. A lot of people thought we were cocky. We were just, uh, uh, we were extremely confident. <laughs> <laughs> and our abilities uh, because we, we worked hard during the week and then we felt that whether it was with the uh, University of Miami Hurricanes winning the national championships or even the Cowboys that nobody out there we felt that nobody out there worked as hard as we did and we felt that we deserved to win and we took that attitude everywhere we went whether it was at the Orange Bowl whether it was at Texas Stadium or whether it was at uh, you know Notre Dame Stadium in South Bend or wherever or RFK it didn't matter. We just felt that we were so prepared 
that we deserve to win. And uh, most of the times we did. Awesome, yeah. Well, you talked about hard work and you talked about some of those individuals, but some of those individuals were known to be characters <laughs> as you chuckle. Yeah, I don't, I, I, you're probably, we're, we're probably two of them, but keeping it PG-13. See you, see who, you later. Who was <laughs> <laughs> one of your favorite characters, favorite teammates that you played with? Well, I, had a lot of, I had a lot of great ones, a lot of great ones. I mean, I can count. Uh, everyone from my college days to Jerome Brown, to Michael Irvin, uh, Danny Stubbs, all the way up to the uh, Cowboy days, Michael Irvin again, you know, Danny Stubbs again, uh, uh, Charles Haley, <laughs> he's hands down probably the, the most um, crazy character that you could actually uh, have a chance to play with. But this guy, he had all kinds of antics throughout the week, but you know, you, you, you knew that on Sunday, that he was going to give his heart out. He was going to play his heart out and play 110%. And uh, that, that, was a, that was a great thing about guys like that. I mean, and you had guys like Chad, who was more straight laced and just came and did a businessman's like job to, uh, and had that approach every day. But then you had Charles that did everything but. But we all, <laughs> we all seemed to come together on that field on that Saturday or Sunday and, uh, or Monday night. And, and, and came together. And that was the greatest thing about being on, on those winning teams. You know, and again, I think that just reaffirms the body of Christ. It takes all kinds of characters, all kinds of talents to pull it all together. But Russ, I mean, you've had some phenomenal success. You're still a young man, you know, a college Outland Trophy winner, uh, All-American, MVP, uh, number one draft pick, the number one draft pick his year in the NFL, the first guy drafted. You're big time, man. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? <laughs> Who would have thought? But it always wasn't that way, was it? As a young kid growing up on the south side of Chicago, um, I think your story is so valid today. And for the young kids that are listening here in the audience today, as well as for all of us, your testimony is very valid. And, and hey, please share it with us. Again, thank you and have at it. All right. Well, I, I appreciate the, the time to be given to talk about my story. And uh, it's, uh, it's an incredible one, definitely. But before I start, I just want to tell you guys thank you for the opportunity to be able to come and speak to you again. I can remember uh, speaking a couple of years ago when you guys uh, were at, down the street at the bread company, I believe it was. How many of you guys were at the bread company? You know about that, see? Yeah, yeah, so uh, this is really a great thing. You got a, got a great room and have, have expanded the membership. And that's awesome, that's awesome. So you guys deserve a hand of applause for that. And uh, I'd like to thank, uh, uh, some great music too. Uh, what do you think about that? Some great music. Now Chad, uh, you know, he's always trying to get me in trouble, you know. Chad told me, he was like, you know that the thing that that guy is sitting on, it's a big box looking thing? He said, that's called a cojone. <laughs> I'm like, really? Okay, that's a cojone. I say, so, uh, so I said, Jim's a cojone player, huh? <laughs> Chad, I'm glad you didn't ask Jim. He's like, hey man, what do you do for a living, man? <laughs> oh, well, you know, I play my cojones. <laughs> yeah, man, we were out at Wingman, man. We were talking about all kinds of good stuff, man. And, you know, I was just playing my cojones the whole time, man. And <laughs> But it's called a cajon, am I correct, Jim? A cajon. All right, not cajon. See, Chad was trying to get me in trouble with you guys. But, uh, but yeah, I grew up in uh, the city of Chicago, south side of Chicago, uh, born in 1969. So I'm a 1970s, 1980s Chicago, Chicago child. And uh, I can remember back in those days, you know, the big thing on uh, for me, it was platform, uh, high heel shoes, bell bottoms, afros, and Soul Train. <laughs> Boy, and Soul Train, I mean, every Saturday morning, you know, I'm up watching Soul Train. I couldn't dance. I still can't dance to this day, but I still like to watch them dance. They can get down, you know. And Soul Train actually started in Chicago, but then moved to LA. So those uh, were very good memories uh, for me back in the day, growing up with my two brothers. Eric, who was uh, three years older, and uh, Brian, who was five years younger. So 
I was the middle child in that group. And uh, I had my, my parents, both of them were hard workers. My father worked for Chrysler Corporation for 30 years as a, and went up through the ranks. And he was one of the trailblazers uh, in the Chicago Zone office, one of the uh, first African Americans in that Chicago Zone office. He stayed there 30 years and put in his time. My mom worked for the Chicago Police Department, not as a, uh, an officer, but as an accountant. And she worked almost 30 years herself uh, in the Chicago Police Department. And they, they worked hard to put food on the table for my brothers and myself. And uh, if you can tell, you might not be able to tell because I'm so spelt and sexy. <laughs> but back then, you know, we needed a lot of food to be put on that table. <laughs> but, um, you know, south side of Chicago, and we weren't in, uh, you might think, you might get the picture of South Side of Chicago, Bad, Bad, Leroy Brown, or whatever. But, um, you know, we were in a, you know, a, a pretty middle class African American neighborhood. My, my, both my parents worked. Um, and so it wasn't like we were, grew up in the ghetto or anything, but um, anywhere in Chicago, if you're at the wrong place at the wrong time, you can get us some trouble. But my parents, I have both my parents in the house, uh, even though they worked a lot of hours, but they were there. I can look back at those times and my father was there, uh, my mother was there, and they helped, helped us steer clear of the troubles that could uh, cost uh, three young boys uh, back in the old, old neighborhood. I wasn't uh, considered a, the greatest athlete. Uh, I do remember uh, growing up, uh, I was slightly chubby, you know. I can remember a lot of kids uh, calling me Fat Albert. Y'all remember the old Fat Albert cartoon? Well, it's Fat Alba right here in, in the flesh, you know. And uh, I, uh, my father really, he made me go out for the football team. I didn't start playing football until I was 13 years old. I graduated uh, from elementary school. And uh, I didn't, uh, I really didn't want to play. I, you know, I was content with every Saturday morning, waking up, watching cartoons, and as I said, watching a whole lot of Soul Train and eating. <laughs> that was, uh, that's, I was good at that. That was my pleasure. It was eating. And me and my brothers, uh, you know, we, we both were big boys. And we got into that refrigerator and we sat down, we watched TV, played video games. You know, a little Atari. You, I know we got some Atari guys in here, you know. For, you know, bloop, bloop, bloop. We don't have the, we don't, <laughs> with the lines and the dots on the screen, we don't have all that wee stuff where you could, ah, ah. We had Atari. And I love to do that. And I was a little bit of a um, complacent child, just a nonchalant child. And I just loved to do that. It was comfortable to me. Until my father one day came into the room that Saturday morning, hey, son, you, you see me out here working hard every day for you and your brothers. And you, I'm not gonna, I see you going in a bad direction. I'm not gonna let you sit down on your butt. Uh, he would use a little bit more colorful language. <laughs> you know how dads can be. And I'm not gonna sit, let you and your brother sit down on your butt all day, every day. So he made me go out uh, for the football team at Whitney Young High School. I was ninth grader, I was 13 years old. He dropped me off and then he left. He actually went around the corner just to see you know, how bad I'd get tore up, you know, which I did. I went out there and I hated it. I hated it, I hated it, I hated it. And uh, every, every, I can remember, before every practice, I got sick, you know, physically, just so nervous, I guess. I, ne I didn't like losing, whether it was video games or, or whatever. And it was just uh, such a, it was, it was such a, a tough time for me. Um, but eventually, I got better. I, I, I lasted through my freshman year. Uh, but many a times I tried to quit. Many a times I tried to quit. I go to my, uh, I go to my mom. I said, Mom, Mom, I don't like this. I don't like this. I can't take it anymore. I can't take it anymore. And she'd be like, Go see your dad. Then I'd be like, Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> but this ain't happening no time soon. But so I stuck with it because I had to, and because my parents uh, made me stick to, stick with it. My freshman year, I got uh, you know, I, I lasted that season. Sophomore year, I got a little bit bigger, got a little bit better, and they moved me up to varsity. I was like, wow, okay, I'm making some strides here. My junior year, I, did, I got a little bit better. My junior year and my senior year, I was a pretty de decent offensive tackle and defensive end. 
I played both ways in the Chicago Public League. I mean, in Chicago, you have 50 high schools in the whole city. I mean, a bunch of high schools, 50 high schools, and that's not including the Catholic and private schools. So I was one of thousands of kids that were playing football in that area. I never did think that I'd get a scholarship. Uh, nobody on my team really ever got uh, big scholarships that I could count, maybe on one hand, that got football scholarships. So after, uh, my, but my junior season, after my junior season, a recruiter from the University of Miami had come and talked to me and said, hey son, you know, you did pretty good. You got some good size, you got some good feet. You know, we're gonna be looking at you your senior year. Well, my senior year comes around, and I didn't hear anything from him, no word from the University of Miami. My father, after my senior year, he said, you know, whatever happened to those guys from the University of Miami, and I'm gonna do some due diligence. I got one offer to get a scholarship. I took a six hour van ride from Chicago to Terre Haute, Indiana, to Indiana State University. I took the visit, I said, well, you know, that's nonchalant, 17 year old then. I came back, my father, I remember a Sunday night after I came back, my, I said, Dad, you know, they offered me a scholarship. You know, I, the coach said I could be the next Larry Bird. <laughs> I could be a sycamore. My father was like, no, you're not going to be no sycamore, son. And I'm like, wow, you know, I, I didn't understand. You know, that was my only offer. That was my only offer. And my dad said I wasn't going uh, to play. But little did I know that he had something in the cards. Back then is when they just started uh, doing the VCR tapes, and uh, I had a VCR tape of my highlight plays that my dad had sent down to the University of Miami just to say, hey, what happened to you guys? This is my son, remember him. He sent the tape down, and I still didn't hear anything from him. January of 86, February of 86, the signing date came. The recruiter from Indiana State came to my lunch period and said, hey, this is your last chance. This is your last chance. And uh, he came to my lunch, and you know, I was eating lunch. <laughs> As you can tell, you know, I don't like to be interrupted while I'm eating lunch, <laughs> whether I'm 17 or 37. <laughs> and I said, no, my dad won't let me go. And so he, he left. And then he came back the next period, my, my study period. He said, this is your very last chance. I know nobody else is recruiting you. And that just kind of hit me hard right there because, you know, I had dreams of maybe going to Notre Dame had dreams of maybe going to the University of Illinois and playing. It just wasn't there. The signing day came and went, and I'm just kind of in a fall for a couple of days until the University of Miami comes back and said, you know what? Hey, son, we saw the tape. We remember you. We're going to offer you the last scholarship. But really, the story behind that was the guys that they were really recruiting, one guy in particular went to the University of Illinois they had one more slot, the last slot, and they didn't want to come out of Chicago empty-handed. So they said, hey, we'll give you this last scholarship in 1986, University of Miami Hurricanes. I took it, and I went, I signed it, sight unseen, and I was a University of Miami Hurricane just like that. So I thought, you know, hey, this is all, I made it now. My, but my dad, he knew better. He said, hey, son, it's time for you to get working now. So I started getting working. I was 321 pounds at the time, 17 years old. My father said, it's time for you to get working. So I said, OK. So I started jogging a little bit. And I lost a whole five pounds by the time, <laughs> by the time July rolled around and went down to the University of Miami. I got there on campus. And man, I tell you what, it was like the tropics, man. I can remember getting off Eastern Airlines, going through the jet bridge at the University of Miami Airport. And from the, just from the, jet, from the airplane through the jet bridge, I broke out into a full-blown sweat. I was all beaded up. I was like, man, it's like the tropics down here. <laughs> there ain't no balmy, you know, 55 degree temperatures like it's back home. So I knew it was time to work. I saw guys like Michael Irvin running up and down Green Tree practice field. Danny Stubbs out in front of all the other linemen. And I got a little bit worried. I got a little bit worried. My parents dropped me off, said, son, Hey, it's time to go, it's time to be a man. I said, okay, I'll see you later. Where you guys headed, back home? No, we're going to Disney World. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no. Hey, they serious, they left me and went to Disney World. I'm like, man, how could you? Man. So they left, and I'm there working out, uh, just working for a couple weeks, and then we had, right before 
uh, the season started, we have a 16-yard uh, dash, uh, well, 16, 110-yard dash test. We have to run a 110-yard dash in 19 seconds with 45 seconds rest in between and do it again. You have to do it 16 times. So that's like a mile worth of, of sprinting. And I can remember that day I was, oh man, I was, you know, I lost a little bit of weight. I was probably down to about 310, but it was still tough. The big player back, in the, back then was Jerome Brown. He was a Outland Trophy candidate, All-American. He was a bad boy. He didn't have to run a 110-yard test. I'm like, wow, you know, this, this guy, you know, he's standing on the sidelines with a stick in his arm and, you know, just stretching out like he's going to do something, but he didn't do nothing because he was Jerome Brown. And Jimmy Johnson, who was our coach at the time, let him get away with that. You know, that's how Jimmy could be sometimes. But I'm, finished, I'm running the test. 19, 20, you know, I'm, I'm doing it all the way up until about number 10. 19, 20, boom, Maryland. That's one, Maryland. Come on now, come on. And I'm just getting, oh, I'm like, oh, Lord, have mercy, please, God, help me. I'm calling everybody now. God, please help me. <laughs> number 12, Maryland. I missed it. Number 13, Maryland. I missed it. I'm coming in. 21, 22. Then the 16th, 23, 24, Maryland. Bam. I drop down to the ground. I'm seeing yellow spots. I'm, I'm almost, I think I'm dying of heat stroke or something, man. And next thing you know, Jerome Brown comes over to me. He's like, Rook, you did a good job, man. You did a good job. Come on, let me lift you up. Let me get you up. And at that point, it was kind of a, it was kind of a revelation for me. Here's a guy who didn't have to. He's an Outland Trophy All-America candidate. He lifts me up. And he says, hey, it's going to be all right. I'm like, JB, thank you. <laughs> now, please call the ambulance. <laughs> <laughs> well, to make a long story short, throughout college, uh, with Jerome Brown's help and the help of a lot of great coaching, a lot of great players, we all came together. And they set standards for how the college football game was to be played. Jerome set a standard for us young guys about how defense and line play should be done. And I, I soaked it all in, and I tried to emulate Jerome Brown. I tried to emulate Jimmy Jones, the older guys, Bill Hawkins, Cortez Kennedy. I tried to emulate that and keep it going. And then when I got to be a senior, and I was doing pretty well, and I was an Outland Trophy candidate, I said, hey, I'm a, I'm a do what was done to me, and I'm going to help the younger guys. I'm going to help them, the uh, Mark Caesars, the Dwayne Rock Johnson, who was a uh, University of Miami football player. It didn't matter if they were freshmen or whatever. I knew that if, we were going to, if they were going to carry the torch, I needed to look down and help those guys up and make sure that they played the best of their abilities. Went on to uh, come here to the Dallas Cowboys in 1991. And uh, it was phenomenal. Back then, I was Outland Trophy winner uh, 20 years ago, an Outland Trophy winner, uh, uh, a first team All American selection. And it was just a, a great, great opportunity. Jimmy Johnson had come, as you know, here from the University of Miami and uh, was the head coach. Jimmy Johnson said, Hey, son, uh, a couple months before the draft, he said, You know what? We know who you are, we know about your reputation and uh, we're going to come and get you. And I'm like, thank you, Coach Johnson. I appreciate it. I didn't think it was going to happen. But sure enough, April of 1991, they made me the first pick in the draft. And I to think, only five years earlier, I was a kid in Chicago, one of thousands. One of thousands. Not even, uh, uh, only one scholarship offer. Not even heavily looked at. And five years later, I'm the number one pick in the draft. It can be done. It can be done. Also, I can remember coming back, not just on the athletic side, and, and of course, you know, I went on to play with the Cowboys and did some great things with the Cowboys, but I think probably the most important thing for me in my life when I look back and I look athletically, I can also look back in my life spiritually. I uh, grew up in uh, it was a, a myriad of religions, I guess. Uh, I grew up as, uh, I went to Merrill Avenue Baptist Church, three blocks away from the house for Sunday school when I was a youngster. Uh, we go to Sunday school, 9.30 to 11 o'clock, 
and then I'd uh, come back home. As soon as they, was, uh, they opened the doors for the church, me and my brothers would head back home, you know, not, uh, 11 o'clock. And then my mother got smart. She said, you know what, son? I'm going to take you to my church, St. John Baptist Church in Chicago, 48th in Michigan, Southern Baptist uh, in Chicago. And my, my mom has been a, a member there for 50 years. She had uh, be, uh, become a member ever since she, went from the, she came up from the Vicksburg, Mississippi. I was there for all my teenage years, and I remember I was on the usher board. And on the usher board, it taught me service. It taught me uh, how to help people in their needs, whether it was just finding their seats or uh, helping them out when they had the Holy Ghost, you know? I can remember I had my, my white gloves on. You, if you could just imagine a big old uh, black kid with white gloves on in a blue suit, you know, with a big usher on his chest. And I can remember um, uh, one, one good story I can remember when I, I, was, I was ushering and the, the, the aisles were about, you know, so wide and I'm a big guy already. And he always used to kill me how we had this one big, real big woman. She was pretty big. <laughs> and I'm big, you know. And uh, during the choir recessional, every time after church, you know, she'd come, come down the aisle, she's saying, lead me, guide me along the way. And she just give me that look like, now you know you, both of us can't fit through this aisle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if you leave me, she just give me that look, and I just have to step away, you know. <laughs> me, out and I stay. <laughs> so, you know, those are things that, you know, as kids, you think about all the time you remember, you know. Next time it happened, I was thinking in my mind, okay, I'm going to let you through. I, I had to get my, my little airline director, and like, okay, come on, leave me. <laughs> But it was there that I first accepted Jesus Christ as my personal savior. January 1st, 1984, I was 13 to 14 years old. And my mother said, hey, I'm not gonna, you know, you know, you'll know when it's time. You know when it's time. I accepted Jesus Christ in my life then. And uh, from there, it, it's, it's, it's been excellent. It's been excellent. It hasn't always been easy, but it's been a great experience. I can remember as about, uh, I was about 280 pounds at the time. And well, Reverend William A. Johnson baptized me. Now Reverend Johnson was about 80 some years old. He was an old guy. And I'm 280 pounds. So I remember, he said, hey son, I'm gonna dip you down in this water, but you're gonna have to get back up on your own. <laughs> 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 I'm like, okay, Ray, I'm gonna help you out. It's, it's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, bam. And lifts me back up, and people were like amazed, like, oh Lord, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> that spiritual strength. <laughs> but it was an excellent experience, excellent experience. And before I left to go to the University of Miami in 1986, I remember Reverend Johnson calling me down to, in front of the congregation. And this was one, another one of those revelations in my life. He called me down and said, hey, son, now you know that Lynn Bias guy. Lynn Bias was a basketball player, I think, from the University of Maryland. He had, uh, was about to get drafted by the Celtics, or maybe had gotten drafted by the Celtics already. And he died from a cocaine overdose. So that had just happened right before I was about to leave to go to the University of Miami. I had on my salmon color three-piece suit with tapered in legs, and they would call them skinny jeans, you know, today. But wasn't nothing skinny on me back there at 321. <laughs> he said, son, I want you to make a, a commitment to us that you won't go down there and get on, them, uh, on that stuff. I said, Reverend Johnson, I made a commitment before everybody. Maybe come up in front of the church. And uh, that was strong for me, because I had to be held accountable to that congregation that I had come up with uh, and, and that I accepted Christ with. Went off to the University of Miami, uh, went to another uh, Cal Cal Catholic church. I had some uh, roommates uh, who were Caucasian roommates. We went to St. Anne's Catholic Church by the, uh, by the campus. I went to Sweet Home Missionary Church down in, uh, in the hood. So I had a myriad of experiences. Uh, my father had converted to Catholicism. 
Uh, my mama stayed at the, her same church. I had a myriad of uh, experiences religious-wise, but it's uh, one thing that I do know, and when you have Jesus Christ in your life, you got it all. You got it all. <laughs> there was times when I, went, when I was at college that I tended to backslide, as we all do as men. There was times when I came here, the Dallas Cowboys stopped going to church. Oh, my excuse, yeah, we play on Sunday, you know? And I wasn't a Bible scholar by any means. I really don't, don't like to read that much. But it wasn't until I found some, some audio tapes, some old audio tapes. I was helping my mother-in-law move in the mid-90s. And I found some of her old audio tapes of the Bible. I said, you know what, I'm going to check these out. And I started listening to it, and I was growing, little by little. You kind of catch on fire, you know? And you learn and learn. It's, and it's a continuous process. It's, as we all know as wingmen, it's a continuous process. And I'm still learning at 42 years old. Now, without Jesus Christ in your life, if you're not plugged in, you're not doing it, man. You're not doing it. And that's the good thing about a group like Wingman here. It helps you to stay plugged in. It helps you to be all you can be. Not like the Army, though, right? <laughs> but, OK, all right. I just want to tell you, um, mentorship meant a lot for me. Mentorship means uh, a lot in one's life. I know how many of you in this room can count on somebody or look, recall somebody helping you sometime along the way? Uh, that's right. Almost every hand goes up. There's always somebody in life that helps you along. If it wasn't my parents, James and Rita Maryland, if it wasn't my teachers, if it wasn't Mr. Arbery McClary, who was the head of the president of the Usher Board, to tell me about how to, to best serve people. Great man. I still remember those lessons from back in the mid-'80s to now. Jerome Brown helping me up off the ground and saying, hey, Rook, you did good. You did good. That meant the world to me. That means everything. And you, you, you just don't know. You don't know if you're going to become the first pick in the draft. That God sends people in your life to intervene and to help you out. The devil can also send people in your life to detract you, to keep you down. So you have to pray for that, that infinite wisdom to be able to discern from those people who want to genuinely help you and from those people that don't want to help you. So mentorship, uh, it means a lot of things. So you guys continue to be good mentors. And to continue to be good students, no matter how old you are, you can always learn a little bit something. You can always learn something. Don't think that you, once you hit a pinnacle, you can, you can stop learning and you've made it. I've had a lot of guys that I play with who get to a certain level, they make a big contract, and say, you know what, I can take a breath now, I made it. But as soon as you stop learning, then you stop earning. As soon as you stop learning, you stop earning. So keep learning, whatever it is in your trade. Don't think that you've made it because it could be taken away. Also, I want to end up, and I want to tell you guys, I kind of see, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I see a troubling trend uh, in this world today where people, the world, try to emasculate men. They try to say, hey, they try to make you weak. That shouldn't happen. That shouldn't happen. There are times in this life that you got to stand up and be a man and man up. It's not just being a bully. It's about being a man. If your kids come to you and say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. No, you can't do this, you can't do that. You got to stand up and be a man. That's what God made us to be. He didn't give us a spirit of fear. God definitely didn't give, uh, give us a spirit of fear. We're warriors. We're warriors, and in this, uh, and it is a, it's a war. This world is a war. It's warfare going on every day of this life. As soon as you step outside, you'll be able to see it and feel it. 
That's why you have to stay equipped. That's the great thing about wingmen. It helps you to be equipped. Every once in a while, we'll fall down. There was a great song a couple years ago by Donnie McClurkin. We fall down, but we get up. We fall down, but we get up. We fall down, but we get up. For a saint is just a sinner who fell down and got up. That's what we here at Wingman are all about, or should be about. When you see your fellow man falling down, sometimes you gotta help him up. Sometimes you gotta help him up. He needs your help. We don't proclaim to know everything about everything. We always need a group to surround us, whether it be in business or whether it be spiritually. If you're the smartest man in your entourage, you got to get a new entourage. <laughs> and, and, and this entourage right here is an excellent one to handle those life's problems. You got to have integrity. You got to watch your tongue. We got to be great fathers. We got to be great husbands. We got to be great brothers. We got to be great co workers. This is where it starts. This is definitely where it starts. You stay plugged in, and it happens. It'll happen. We'll fall down, but with the wingmen, they'll help you back up every single time. And we all need it. I um, thank God for my friend Chad Hennings over here, who was my wingman at the Cowboys, maybe only for a couple years. When I fell down, he helped me up. If I fell down, or if he fell down, I helped him up. And I thank God for him. And I thank God for the things he's done after those cowboy days to assemble this great group of men here today. I thank God for you, Chad. Thank God for your family. Guys, stay plugged in. Stay plugged in. Man up. Don't let the world tell you that you need to be soft. We don't need to be soft. We need to be men. We need to be men. And we, we'll, we'll stay men. Amen. <laughs> Chad. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Russ, thanks, man. And uh, just stay up here for a second. You know, your message, it resonates so well that we're all mentors, guys. Every one of you is a mentor. Your kids are watching, your grandkids, your coworkers. You never know who you're going to impact. So that's where it talks about daily putting on the armor of God, arming yourself, because you never know. When you're going to run down that field and get ear hole, <laughs> blindsided, somebody going to block you or hit you, right? That's right. So, man, I thank you for your coming here. And, guys, let's pray over Russ. Let's pray over his, his impact in the community and pray for one another, and we'll be on our way. Two weeks back here, two weeks, wingman.org website. You'll see Russell's svelte-looking picture up there, <laughs> and you can watch us. Forward this on to your friends once we upload it on the archive. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your sovereignty, for your mercy. I thank you for these men here at Wingman today, and I thank you for the men that are, are listening remotely. For Lord, we are called for one purpose. We are called to, to worship you and to make your name known. I thank you for Russell. I thank you for his transparency, for his willingness to share. Lord, I pray that you continue to bless him, bless his family, provide them protection, provision. Bless him, Father, in the words that he says and the impact that he has in the community, for he has a ministry, a ministry to men and a ministry to kids. I pray for the men here. Lord, I pray that you bless them. I pray that you continue to motivate us, to convict us when we are wrong, but to inspire us, to edify us to be the men of God that you are calling us to be, the husbands, the brothers, the fathers. 
And above all, Lord, as Russell so eloquently put it, to be men after your own heart, mighty men of David. To go out and to battle daily. To resist the temptations as this world throws at us. But to lift your name up and to make an impact in your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, brother. Right. Better, guys. Thank you. Awesome. Right, brother. Thank you. Great job. Great job. Great job. Thanks for your support of Wingman Ministries. We would love to hear your comments about today's show and help you get connected with other men in your local area. To keep up to date on upcoming events, element groups, and speakers, please visit our website at wingman.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for our email list.